Good morning, everybody. Everybody doing well? Good, good. Good to see you. Uh, let's pray. Let's open in prayer. God, we love you. Lord, we thank you that you have brought us here together to study your word, to learn uh, about you, from you, and uh, Lord, to learn more about um, how you desire to be worshipped, God. And we want to do this in a way that uh, you have designed and that you have glorified yourself through, Lord. So we just pray that you bless this time. Give us the grace to, um, to study you well, to speak of you in a way that glorifies you, and to uh, set our preferences aside for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. We've already done, let's see, I'm going to jump ahead to where we left off. Bum, 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 bum. Um, let's see, here we are. From where Don derailed us last week. I couldn't find another class that was All right, so we're going to talk, last week we talked obviously about uh, content, and we talked about um, including, in, uh, in implementing instruction in what we sing, that we want our songs to teach as well as to glorify and to, to a, bring adoration, and uh, that's still super important. Uh, this week we're going to talk about quality. And uh, excellence in creativity. I'm going to grab my Bible. Actually, I'm just going to use my phone. You know how it is. It's just quicker. Um, any questions, lingering thoughts from last week? Obviously, we went on like the big Christian publishing uh, train of thought, which is helpful. Um, I think it will, and I'll tell you why. Um, typically, the way the fault lines typically fall on the issues of like which publishers, which churches do we sing and stuff, it tends to be the conservative side that tends to cut publishers out of their song rotation. Um, and what I'm what I've noticed uh, is how many churches that lean more liberal are calling Hillsong basically like a cult, <laughs> which is uh, strong language. So it, it's funny. I think you'll have churches who are like singing Bethel and Elevation but won't sing Hillsong. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, <laughs> so it's interesting how that I think is going to play. But I think, I think financially they're going to suffer a lot. I think a lot of places are going to rethink the implementation of not just, I mean, they're, you know, here the most that we've had any interaction with Hillsong is we sing a couple songs now and then. There are churches that are like, their their worship training is built on Hillsong's trainings. And and I know some great people who came through it. One of, a good friend of mine uh, lived in Australia and went through their university and had a wonderful experience. So, you know, there's there's pockets of good work being done but yeah, I think it. I think that it is going to be interesting. I think the churches who weren't singing Hillsong before are still just going to not sing Hillsong. Uh, but I think there's a lot of liberal churches that are going to cut them as well, um, and cut some of that direct participation with their training institutes and stuff. <sighs> Maybe, yeah. Unfortunately, um, or you know. Uh, some churches, and we've already seen this, have discovered how much of a money stream it is to produce your own music, and so, which is interesting. And we'll talk a little bit about this about creativity this morning. Um, yes, right. Uh, it's a good question. We, I specifically, um, spend a lot of time listening to new music that comes out and following new artists that are producing stuff. 
Um, because it's, you know, it's not my goal to, like, obviously to keep us on, like, the cutting edge of, like, the new worship music stuff. Because um, the irony is, like, there is no cutting edge of worship music. Like, every cutting edge of worship music is what some band in England was doing 10 years ago. So, uh, there's that. But, um I, it's it's a lot of just like digesting new music that's coming in and seeing like yes like I think this would be beneficial for our church and and so and we'll talk about this next week or final week about like the really intensive stuff of like here's our song selection process um, but in terms of introducing new music it has to be something that I think stylistically this is gonna hit a large swath of our church. Like, a lot of folks w- can get behind this stylistically. Um, it has to theologically, obviously, be sound. And not just theologically, like, sturdy. Like, you can have, like, a theologically, like, safe song that's not particularly edifying. You know, like, I don't want to... Uh, like, someone asked me to sing a song recently... Um, that is a perfectly fine song. There's nothing theologically wrong with it at all. But the first verse starts off very like uh, personal storytelling kind of thing. Just nothing wrong with that at all. It's, right, it's just not congregational. It's not what I want us to sing as a group. You know what I mean? Be like, I woke up this morning. You know what I mean? Like, like you know, yeah, we all woke up this morning, but like that's not the vibe we're going for. You know, like, uh, so... Uh, something that like benefits us all when we all sing it and is rich, it's instructional, um, and typically it'll be because I'll add a new song because we have like a, a shortage of songs in a particular liturgical category. You know, like right now I'm kind of gathering some more songs on confession and repentance because we just don't have a ton in our library at the moment. Um, so that's usually what I'm looking for. And, yeah, like I said, there are some, like, publishers that I'll just skip wholesale. I don't even bother listening to. Um, but uh, there are other ones that I know are are not just safe, but, like, are really beneficial and typically, like, only put out really solid stuff. And then other ones who are just like, yeah, some of these songs are great. Some of them don't fit us, you know. Uh, a good example is, like, um, we introduced a song in ni- 19, yeah. Uh, by a group called People and Songs, just like it fit, it, it was a perfect fit for us because it was it was a choir song, and we were bringing back the choir, but it also like stylistically kind of struck a chord that we don't hit very often, but I knew people would like, and it uh, uh, was like liturgically was a perfect fit. It was fun for the choir, and there's some stuff from that group that like I wouldn't want us to sing at church not because it's bad because it just wouldn't be a good fit but so it's like it's one of those things where like there's no sovereign grace song that I think like that will never be sung at Buck Run you know what I mean like it's other than like stylistically maybe but um but there's some stuff from some artists where it's like yeah like this let's take this one this one nah not for us kind of thing so that's kind of does that answer your question? Oh, that's kind of I could talk about that for ages, so I'm trying to be focused. But <laughs> yeah, yeah, and just to kind of give you a preview of next week, like I'll just say it, it is a process every week. It's one that's done very prayerfully, carefully. Um, we don't just like, I've been in churches where like literally you walk in on Sunday morning and you're like, what do you guys want to sing this morning? You're like flip through songs and like, oh, we haven't done this one in a while. Like that's not how we roll. Like it is planned out, very intentional. Do what? Monday. On Monday, yeah. <laughs> yeah, tomorrow, Monday is worship planning day because we have to give the band time to rehearse the songs and stuff. But good question. All right, let's talk about uh, quality. So the pursuit of excellence in worship is biblical and God-honoring. And when I talk about the pursuit of excellence, I mean um, playing and singing skillfully 
songs that are skillfully written, right? Like, we want good songs, and we want to play them well. Um, we are called to play skillfully, Psalm 33.3. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and pull both of these up here. So we can, can somebody grab Colossians 3.23 and I'll get the psalm. I'm going to read verses 1 through 3, actually, of Psalm 33. This is a great call to worship. Shout for joy in the Lord, O you righteous. Praise befits the upright. Give thanks to the Lord with a lyre. Make melody to him with the harp of ten strings. Sing to him a new song. Play skillfully on the strings with loud shouts. Uh, that, I think that word choice is important. There's stuff in here that is uh, descriptive and stuff that's prescriptive, right? Like, I don't think the lyre and the harp of ten strings is prescriptive. I think that's describing their culture, the instruments they had at hand, what was appropriate for their music with worship. But I think sing to him a new song and play skillfully, I think those are prescriptive. I think that's something that we need to aspire to. Um, who has Colossians 3.23? Yeah. Right. We apply that a lot to our, like our place of business, right? Which is, is appropriate. Uh, but it's whatever you do. And that includes uh, playing and singing in the band, singing in choir. We work hard at it. We try to do it well uh, for the glory of the Lord because we do it as if we are doing it for him. We don't do it for ourselves. We don't do it for our own spotlight. We play and sing skillfully for the glory of the Lord. Uh, excellence for the worshiper is more in the striving than in the outcome. Uh, this is an important distinction in the way that we view worship. Uh, there is, historically, there's kind of been two different schools of thought on what, um, what the arts should achieve in worship, uh, in, in churches, and what they should aspire to. There's kind of the, um, C.S. Lewis kind of had this idea that like, that nothing would ever top Bach, right? Like Bach was what worship should be, Box would spend, you know, eight hours every day rehearsing his, like, one fugue for worship that Sunday. And, like, like, it was super intense, and it was all about excellence. And, I mean, Bach was excellent, right? We can all agree, whether you stylistically enjoy it or not, like, just incredible musicianship, composition. Uh, and so there was this, like, C.S. Lewis kind of camp where it was, like, everybody should aspire to that, Right, like if you're not trying to be Bach, if you're not trying to achieve like the human pinnacle of musicianship and composition, then you're not worshiping well. Uh, and I love C.S. Lewis, but I disagree with him on that. I don't think that's what God has called us to, and I think there's biblical principles that back that up. Um, this is a great quote from Harold Best. It says, "Excellence is the process. Note the word process of becoming better." than I once was. Because God does all things well, we should likewise do well. While we strive to be truthful, we will strive to state truth beautifully. And in proceeding this way, I honor God by trying to work as God does. In the meantime, God is free to work any time, in any place, and in any way at all. Um, so Harold Best kind of thought is, it's in the striving that we honor God, right? Because in his mind, as good as Bach was, was Bach's worship worthy of the King of Kings? Right? Like, it was really, really great, but it still ultimately falls short of what God deserves, right? Uh, so even in Bach's most perfectly executed fugue on the most pristine 65-degree sun, sunny Sunday morning when everything seems perfect, that's still operating in a Genesis 3 world. There's still sin in Bach's heart. Uh, there's still sin in that congregation. And Christ has to redeem that futile attempt to worship him and uh, elevate it through his sacrifice, through his righteousness, as something appropriate for the worship of the Lord. So 
the same thing happens to us, right? So that isn't a free pass to play poorly, but it's just a reminder that like the way that Bach glorified God is not in how many notes he could fit in in a measure, because he could fit in a lot, but it was in his intense striving, right? Bach's striving just sounds a lot better than my striving because he's more talented than me, okay? So that's, that's why it feels different. Um, but we strive, we press on to, uh, to do things well. Let's look at, uh, let's look at, turn to Lulke. <laughs> Swedish standard version. First corruptions. All right, Luke 2, uh, 21, sorry. Man, I can't read this morning. Luke 21. This is not a passage on the birth of Christ. <laughs> Luke 21. Jesus looked up and saw the rich putting their gifts into the offering box, and he saw a poor widow putting in two small copper coins. And he said, truly, I tell you, this poor widow has put more in this than all of them, for they all contributed out of their abundance, but she, out of her poverty, put in all she had to live on. The economy of skill leaves some with riches and some in poverty, right? Like we, uh, we all know someone in our lives who can't carry a tune. It's just, yeah, thank you. I didn't want to call you out, Fred, but I appreciate you volunteering that information. <laughs> <laughs> but does that mean that that Fred or others like him are not <laughs> I'm sorry I should not be calling you out people who are lacking in skill should should they still sing in congregational worship absolutely absolutely my mom god bless her like cannot clap on a beat at all it's the weirdest thing she has an ear for harmony where she, I, I have a hard time hearing harmony, but my mom can hear any song and just, boom, start singing the harmony. But if it gets to where we're all clapping along, it's the funniest thing. It looks like her batteries are, like, running out. It's bizarre. She watches all of these, and I'm going to get a text about it. Um, but, uh, but there is glory to God made in the striving and in the... Uh, just the, the laying out of ourselves. And I think there's, there's something to be said about someone who's willing to sing poorly in front of other people for the glory of God. Because that's, that's uh, you know, that's, it's very revealing. It's a vulnerable thing. Um, you know, we have, uh, we have friends who are physically, because of disease or ailments, physically incapable of producing pitch who still sing on Sunday mornings. That's a very potent reminder of, of that God redeems that. You know, it has nothing to do with the excellence of the notes. It's just in that attempt and in that striving. Um, yes, it is, exactly. It's a joyful noise. Right, right. Um, we are, we are called to worship out of our riches and out of our poverty to give it all. Um, Bach had, a, had um, an abundance of skill. He gave out of his riches, which is why Bach still glorified the Lord because Bach could have phoned it in. He didn't know what a phone was, but every, every Sunday morning he could have just walked in without any rehearsal and just sat down and do, 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 do. And his congregation would have been blown away and everything would have been fine. But he didn't. He put in all of that extra work because he was giving out of abundance. And, you know, which glorifies God more? Bach playing that fugue or your grandfather plucking out a song on an out-of-tune guitar on his porch singing, you know, Just As I Am. Like, that is still Christ redeeming what we have. It's back to what I talked about last week about the refrigerator art, right? Like, we're just, we're doing our best and God loves it, God redeems it. Um, let's see, I feel like there was another quote I wanted to not miss here. Yes, 
but yeah, I think in my kind of thought is in the congregation, anything goes. Um, you know, I think hopefully if that if that happens here, and I have people saying like, man, like so and so just like can't carry a tune, or it's like throwing off this whole section. I think we need to get intentional then and start asking people who do sing, be like, y'all go sit over here. Let's let's join in that chorus. <laughs> And not with the intention of, of drowning them out, but just with the intention of helping others around him or her, like, hear. Right, yeah, yeah. If he's singing louder than y'all, then put him to shame, you know? <laughs> like, we had um, we had a guy, uh, an older gentleman, CT, at Faith in... No, it was good. It was just really funny. I was, you know, I would be leading the invitation... Um, like a nice, soft, just me up there, finger-picking version of I Surrender All. And, you know, I'm up here, like, sounding like a Sufjan Stevens cover of I Surrender All. And I'd get to the chorus, and I'd be like, I surrender all. And then he'd come in with, I surrender all. <laughs> like, he, like, he had his part memorized from choir, and you could hear it throughout the entire, like, right. And it, it, the first time it threw me off, by the 20th time, I was, like, loving it. I was like, where's CT? I can't wait till he does it. And it's, so it's just, it's kind of like learning to see the good in it and see, you know, God has blessed him with remembering that part from, gosh, I mean, CT was in his 80s. So, you know, CT, yeah. I don't remember what CT stood for. It doesn't matter, but, but you know, just he's coming out of like 50 years of singing in choral music, and that's his part. He's going to sing it, and God bless him. I'm not going to tell him not to, you know. Right. The, yes. Yeah. The, there is a there is a balance of there's a. We have to be kind of guardians of who we give a mic to. Um, and that's not out of some, like, desire to achieve, like, a performance or, like, executing things, but it is because at that point, it's super distracting, right? Like, that's where it gets, like, dangerous to the whole congregation's <laughs> ability to worship if, because we are, I tell the band all the time, everyone on stage is the worship leader in that moment. We're all leading worship. So, uh, that comes down to the way that we stand, you know? I don't want anyone, like, doing this, like, playing bass, like, bored out of their mind, because that's, that's leading worship. It's leading in the wrong direction, <laughs> but it's leading. So we're careful, and we curate that intentionally uh, to lead the church well. Um, and so there's some people who shouldn't be leading worship, but no one should not be participating in worship. Like, we should all be participants. Not everyone is called to be a leader, and so we have to just shepherd that carefully. Right. And that's something that we look for in our worship leaders is people who know, like, all right, like this, I'm going to contribute something that's beneficial to this song and to this. Yeah. That's a good question. Um, so continuing on the uh, creativity th or the excellence thing, this is not um, a free pass for dwelling in mediocrity, right? Like, we don't want to just rely on our talents and phone it in. We also don't want to uh, elevate and create a culture of mediocrity because that, that can happen pretty easily. That's, uh, it's a lot less pressure on staff and on people making those kind of decisions if we just kind of let anything go. And, and the truth is the church will survive and you know as long as we're still preaching the word, like we'll get through it. But it's not what we're called to do. Uh, another quote here from Harold Best. Oh, goodness. Gosh, I hate keynote. Harold Worst. <laughs> that's, that's good. Uh, instead of wondering why God works through mediocrity at all, we should assume that God would prefer excellence, but not at the expense of spiritual integrity. Um, that's a really, really important caveat at the end there, because this can really quickly swing the other direction, and we've seen this as well. Um, churches that have bigger budgets. I have a really small budget for guest musicians, and it's usually just to cover, like, another trusted person to come in and lead worship when I'm on vacation or whatever. Um, I'm not, like, bringing in hired guns 
to come in and, and play with us that often because, again, we believe everyone on stage is a worship leader. I like to know the heart and the faithfulness of the people that are on stage. So that's why I try my best to only use people who are part of Buck Run. If it's someone who's not part of Buck Run for like a special event, it's someone that I personally know. Um, we had um, one of our uh, instructors at Boyce was telling us how like early in his career, like the late 80s, he got onto, uh, he was a worship pastor at a church and they had an orchestra. It was a big church, big Southern Baptist church. And they had this full orchestra and he found out that no one in the orchestra was a member of the church. They were all just unbelieving orchestra musicians who were hired to come in and play in the orchestra. And from an excellent standpoint, they're hitting the nail on the head, right? Like you've got local like symphony orchestra players from like, you know, the LSO coming in. It sounds incredible, but, and it's not like they were doing anything radically inappropriate, but there's a, they're sending a message there, I think. Um, I would rather our own people do the best that we can than bring in hired guns that can show us up and have no connection to our community, have no uh, accountability. You know, like, what if we befriend someone in that group uh, and, you know, we follow them on social media and we find out they have some kind of lifestyle that's super in contradiction to what we believe, and then that becomes known, and then that person's up here playing cello. You know what I mean? Like, it's, there's all kinds of problems that happen here, and this happens all the time. Um, there's a huge culture of, like, hired gun musicians coming in because they want to achieve that excellence, but it's at the expense, in my opinion, of spiritual integrity. So that's why we avoid it. Um, so again, Jesus perfects our offerings. Um, oh, another point. I didn't mention this before. Um, our striving for excellence should be an outpouring of worship, not an outpouring of covetousness for another church's appeal. Um, it's so easy to play the comparison game, uh, especially once you're on staff and you have to make these decisions and you start looking at what other churches are doing and how they are doing them. And you're like, man, so-and-so's live stream just sounds so good. <laughs> why does our live stream not sound that good? Or why, why is our drum like, like, like their snare just like pops on that recording and we just can't get it to not sound mushy. Like those are things that I tell myself all the time. And uh, we have to not fall into the comparison trap of like, if our striving for excellence is so that we can be better than another church, then we're, our striving is in vain, right? It's no longer God-honoring striving. It's self-glorifying striving. So if our striving is we want to give God our best, then we're, then we're doing the right thing. But as soon as it drifts into, I want to sound as good as so-and-so, then it's a problem. So Jesus perfects our offerings. Um, God sees and hears all our offerings perfected. God sees and hears as no human being can, all because our offerings have been perfected by the giver. The out-of-tune singing of an ordinary believer, the hymnic chant of the aborigine, the open frankness of a primitive art piece, the nearly transcendent kiri of Bach's B minor mass, the praise choruses of the charismatic, the drum praise of the Cameroonian, Everything from the widow's might to the poured out ointment of artistic action are at once humbled and exalted by the strong saving work of Christ. While the believer offers, Christ perfects. It is all of Christ and it is all of faith. So again, Christ in his work, his perfecting work in our worship is the center point of what we do. All right, let's talk about creativity. Uh, creativity is a gift of the creator. It's modeled by him in creation. Um, throughout the Psalms, we read the repeated call to sing a new song. And we could look all these up, but I'll just give you a teaser. They all say sing a new song. <laughs> like that's, that's the call, right? Um, when we read that, I think... Uh, I did for years. I just kind of glossed over that, right? To sing a new song. Cool. 
but I do think it is, it is a biblical call for creation of new music to the glory of the Lord. Uh, I don't think that means that, like, as a church, we're constantly introducing new stuff. Like, we'll get into, like, that again next week in, like, song selection and introducing new music and all the problems that that can cause. Um, but I think it means that if you can create new songs, keep doing it. Keep creating, keep singing, keep writing new stuff for the glory of the Lord. And it doesn't even, they don't even have to be great songs. They don't have to be songs that anyone else hears. Um, I tell students all the time, I have guys that'll be like, you know, I kind of started working on this like worship song. It's not very good. Um, I'm like, well, it's great. I don't even have to hear it. It's great. Just keep doing it. Write another one. Keep going. And just keep writing. If you've got notebooks and, and voice memos full of like mediocre praise songs, glory to God. Like that's awesome. Keep doing it. Keep writing. There are so many more songwriters in our midst than we realize. Um, and it is a wonderful, wonderful thing. And if you can't write music, don't feel left out. <laughs> like don't feel like you're failing in some ways. There are all different kinds of ways of through creativity, um, worshiping God, but that's just one of the ones that um, I think is cool that David, our chief songwriter of the faith, has pointed out. Uh, worship songwriting is not for the pros, it's for the redeemed. Anyone who uh, can string words together and a melody together can write a song for the Lord. And again, that doesn't mean that I expect you to have it recorded and released on Spotify and then shared on the Instagram account. Like That's not the goal, right? If that's where you go, great. But even if it never leaves your shower, it's fine. Like, just sing, and just sing for the Lord. Um, besides newness, creativity also brings diversity. Um, because there is uh, this tendency that when we write new songs, we're going to write them from our perspectives. You know, our backgrounds, uh, our struggles, the things that the Lord has done through us, are going to come out in our songwriting when we write new songs for the Lord. Uh, and so that helps us minister to more people, you know. Um, I'm trying to think. Uh, Bob Coughlin is a great uh, worship songwriter, right? Maybe the best living right now. He just has this incredible track record. So why is Bob not the only songwriter at Sovereign Grace? Well, for one, Bob doesn't want that workload of like being the only one producing new music, but also because he knows that creativity among believers produces diversity. We have diverse opinions on how we should handle things, diverse backgrounds and the things that uh, the trials that we've come through. And so, uh, you know, I'm trying to think of, there was a Christmas song that came out a couple years ago that was written by a woman who had dealt with years of infertility. And we sang it at Christmas. And I don't introduce the song by saying, this is a song about struggling with infertility, right? I don't need to, because it's a congregational, appropriate song that, that men can sing, everyone can sing. But if you have struggled with infertility, you're not going to miss it. You're going you're gonna to catch that. And... Uh, or whatever it is that you've struggled with that has that same kind of heart-wrenching feeling to it, that emptiness and that sinking feeling. Uh, the way that she crafted those words of how God had used that time and God redeemed that time and God was with her through that. You know, Bob can't write that song. That song wouldn't exist. So we sing a new song. We bring in Lisa Clow and we write one of the best Sovereign Grace songs in the last, like, 20 years. And we sing it at church uh, because that's part of God's path for her life in redeeming that time of infertility and how he used that to minister to so many people. I can't tell you, when we sing new songs, I'll usually get like a, someone will say after church, like, hey, like that new song. It was good. When we sang that song, I got email after email of people like, I don't know who sang that, who wrote that, but that, that was something. That meant something to me. Thank you for putting that new song out there. That's the Lord working through his people being obedient to uh, the call to creativity as sub-creators honoring the creator. All right. 
Um, we've got a little bit of time left, so we'll talk about uh, unity. Again, we're back to our, our five tenets of creating a modern philosophy of worship after the worship wars. So we did content, adoration, instruction, quality, excellence, and creativity. So this is unity, preference, and deference. Uh, unity is to be desired. It is a good thing. Psalm 133.1, Behold how good and pleasant it is when brothers dwell in unity. But unity is not sameness, right? That's important. Unity is not uh, uniformity. It's not everyone being exactly the same. It is dwelling together in the spirit of unity. Uh, so we uh, want to represent, uh, when it comes to, to the musical side of the worship service, we want to represent a diversity in style, genre, and instrumentation that can exist in unity together. Uh, so let's talk about preference. We cannot worship two masters, God and preference. Uh, we already talked about the worship wars the worship wars were an outburst of preference, right? Entire churches dividing up into like three separate services based on preference. I can't tell you how unhealthy that is for a church. Um, I know there's a lot of churches still doing it. Um, and, you know, they have their reasons. But it really does become three separate churches. I mean, we experienced this and... Uh, you know, talk about like just automatically out of the gate, like as part of your prescription for the church, you're making at least like two or three like clicks. And it's just, and especially when like it's based on something as silly as preference. It's just not good. Um, preference is modeled for us in every aspect of secular culture. You know, it's the, the have it your way. Uh, Burger King is great, but I mean, well, yeah, yeah maybe, not, maybe not great. Burger King is okay. But uh, we have choices everywhere for everything. Um, we, we get to pick to the finest detail all kinds of things, and we struggle to shed that mentality when we come to church. Um, so much of what we do at church is automatically, right out of the gate, uh, bucking up against culture, right? Like, it's just it's the way we are. Like, we, we believe in one God. Uh, if we believe in any God at all, that's uh, anti-cultural. What's not anti-cultural? What's the word I'm looking for? Countercultural. Thank you. I, I was, like, right there, and I couldn't get it. Countercultural. Um, but uh, one of the things we don't think about is uh, shedding this preference. Like, our the muscle in our brains that gets to decide the things that we want and to have things our way gets exercised six days out of the week. And so we come in flexing that muscle on Sunday morning, and it's hard to relax. Uh, it's hard to put that preference aside. Um, a church fighting over a worship style is antithetical to church and to worship. Um, if if that becomes the battle line, there's, there's already so many other things that are just kind of folding that shouldn't be happening. So what do we do about preference? Um, preference itself is not sinful. It's okay to have preferences. Our preferences help tell our story. They tell about where we're from. Um, they are shaped by our history, our culture, nostalgia, our desires, and our loves. Um, and I think that's good. That's fine. That's healthy. But untamed preference is self-indulgence leading to self-worship. Um, we can, our preference can be confused with correctness, Right? Um, I mean, even in like the political world, 
it's so much more, uh, there's, there, the, the Venn diagrams are overlapping a lot less, right? Like it's a lot of like this camp and this camp and there's less overlap. And so there's a lot of like, if, if it has if one piece is in here, then the other piece can't be in here. There's, and that happens in all aspects of society. Our musical preferences can get the same way. Our, uh, our theological preferences can be the same way. I can't worship with someone who believes this about the Trinity. Um, I mean, if anyone's got like Trinitarian heresy, don't, don't, don't go there. But you know what I'm saying. <laughs> but like, you know, like post mill and ah mill like can't worship together. Like, that's not the point. Like, we can set aside preference on uh, smaller things. Uh, as churches broke off into more services or more churches, they became one dimensional worshipers, isolated in an echo chamber of preference. Um, this is getting ahead of myself, but preference is then confused with correctness and even theological correctness. One of the things that we noticed. If this it goes on long enough, you get to a point to where it's no longer like, all right, the 930 service is kind of doing their 930 thing. Like, there's people who kind of feel like the, the other services are sinning in their preferences, right? That's, oh, man, that's hard. Like, we got to avoid that. Like, there's so many things wrong with that, but it comes back. That's why we talk about first about, like, the widow's might, right? Like, maybe it's not the best, but Christ is redeeming it. They're not sinning. So our preference cannot be confused with correctness. So the, the remedy to preference, then, is deference. We can honor God by deferring to the preferences of others. So what does that mean? It means we will not always sing the songs that we love the most. Um... It also means we will not always hear the sounds that we love the most. Um, I, th- I think a lot of people assume that, like, when I'm leading worship, that we're singing all of Adrian's favorite songs at Buck Run, right? Spoiler alert, they're not all my favorite songs. <laughs> I, I, I love all the songs we sing for a lot of different reasons, but it's not what I'm listening to when I go home. It's not what I would be playing if I was doing like a concert, right? I wouldn't play most of these songs at like a concert. This is not Adrian's preference time. It's what's going to serve Buck Run this morning and what's going to fit those needs. And it's setting aside my preferences and deferring to the preferences of others a lot of times. Um, We will always honor God. We will always honor the God we love the most when uh, deference is part of the formula. Mike Cosper in Rhythms of Grace writes, grace makes the deference joyful. Um, that is, that's a hard place to get to, to where a, a band or a worship leader is leading a song that you just, you're not feeling it. You don't like it. Uh, and we could, it can go either direction, right? Like it could be too modern, it could be too loud, it could be too fast, or it could be too traditional, be too slow, could be too quiet. Uh, I'm going to make everyone at Buck Run uncomfortable at some point with a song that we sing. <laughs> like it's just, it's inevitable because we're trying to, we're hitting from a lot of different uh, preferences. But knowing that someone else in the room is being really served by this particular song makes the deference joyful having grace to know I'm glad so-and-so can belt this one out with all of their heart this week. That's, that's the beauty of congregational worship, right? Or all of the verses that Baptists have skipped for some reason. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a lot of, lot of, all right, verse three, and you're like, wait a second, have you read verse two? It's so good. <laughs> yeah, that uh, happens all the time, yeah. Yeah, 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 I don't, or how many there are, yeah. And granted, you know, some songs have like eight verses. Hillsong did not invent the long worship song, okay? Like, Isaac Watts would like a word. Like, <laughs> <laughs> Yes, it is, it is. 
I even had this, I'm dealing with this right now in a song that we're recording, that uh, it's a new setting for, oh God, our help in ages past, uh, which I didn't grow up singing. And I didn't grow up singing it for a reason, because the, the original tune that it's set to is, is difficult to sing. It's hard. It's hard to play. Um, so it, it doesn't get sung a lot in like small country churches where I grew up. Um, but man, the lyrics are so good. And I, I had to like cut some because I was like, I, I can't make like a 12 minute long song, <laughs> but how do I pick which ones to cut? And it's hard. Uh, but yeah, that's a great point, Janet. Thank you for sharing that. Cause it does, um, seeking that newness does help with that a lot. Yeah. No, you know, they, uh, I, I have some problems with their theological standpoints on a few things. The, the basis is kind of off the rails, so I don't, this is the dietary problems. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, which some people thought was real, and I apologize if you thought that was real. <laughs> what happened to Michael Tate? He's stuck in his tight pants somewhere. He couldn't get out. I had to find a new singer. Sorry. I'm sorry. I can't make fun of... My preferences are showing. <laughs> if you love the newsboys, I will defer to that. Okay. My wife is keeping me in line. All right. Deference is culturally expected in other areas of life. This is good. Somebody pull up 1 Corinthians 10, 27. Read it when you got it. Eat whatever is set before you without raising any question on the ground of conscience. Man, isn't that hard? If we could just get churches to eat whatever was set before them, right? <laughs> and so it is normal and it is expected in other areas of life that we, we just defer preferences. Why? For the sake of the gospel, you know? Like we... We're not going to fight over this stuff, especially if there are unbelievers present. Like, we want them to see the church loving and worshiping in unity. Um, and so the responsibility then becomes on your pastors who have to shepherd that, right? Uh, but don't take that on yourself. Don't feel that burden. Just pray for your pastors and pray for... Um, uh, your own heart and the hearts of your brothers and sisters that you're worshiping with, that we can do this in unity. Right. So that's where the responsibility then comes on, like the shepherding aspect of like, we don't want to ask you to worship in unity with something that would cause someone else to stumble. You know, the, the, uh, the outside of the church, like the non-musical counterpart that this passage get used, gets used for all the time is alcohol, Right where some believers feel comfortable with alcohol. They don't see a problem with it used in moderation. Other believers have very strong you know, teetotalers, which is the way I grew up. Like, we just don't have anything to do with alcohol. Um, and can you be a believer and, and participate in this? Can you, you know, so that's why, like, if someone is a believer who uh, participates in alcohol, I expect them to not offer that to someone who comes to their house from the church, right? Like, we don't, like, if, like, fine. If that's your thing, we can, we can talk about the merits of that separately in a different class, but uh, what you definitely shouldn't be doing is offering that person alcohol and expecting them then to uh, have to either take a stand in your living room and, like, refuse it on the grounds of conscience or... Um, or to try to just muster up the strength and get through it. You know, like, we don't want to put people in that position. The same is true on the musical side of things and on the worship side of things. Uh, I, we don't want to offer you something that will cause some people to stumble in our church, right? Um, so do I have brothers and sisters who lead worship and who think that's okay? I do. Um, but... I know that like it would be a check in the conscience for a lot of our people, so we're we're not going to do that. So that's that's how alcohol plays into worship music. If you were wondering, <laughs> uh, so preference and deference in practice uh, it comes down a lot to song selections. Uh, we seek to sing diverse songs that appeal to the diverse preferences of the whole body. And you may be thinking like, 
do we really have diverse preferences here? Trust me, on the receiving end, we do. Um, remember those, we used to have, when we used to have bulletins, we had like the prayer uh, requests, thing, prayer cards, you'd tear out prayer requests. I know if there's ever a prayer request that landed in the worship pastor's mailbox, it's not a prayer request. <laughs> it's, a, it's a rebuke or a song selection, like a song suggestion. Uh, so that happens, that used to happen all the time. I'm glad that the bulletins are gone now. It's made my life easier. Uh, yeah, I've muted it. You're right. Um, but there are diverse opinions. Now, if someone from the outside looked at Buck Run, scanned the room, diverse is not the word that would come to mind, right? Like, we don't look like a diverse church because we don't culturally look uh, very diverse. We don't ethnically look very diverse. Uh, but when it comes to preferences of worship style, we are diverse. Uh, we've got Angelines who are, you know, elder millennials but grew up in churches that never sung hymns. Uh, so, like, every hymn that we sing is like a new song for her. Um, we have folks who grew up in churches where hymns were always sung. We, we've already covered this, but you understand that, like, it's very varied, uh, even in, like, the, the hymns group, right? Like, which kind of hymns? Are you, like, the Jesus paid it all kind of hymns, or are you the, you know, a mighty fortress is our God kind of hymns? Because those two people don't typically overlap. And so sing more hymns doesn't make everyone happy. <laughs> sing more contemporary worship doesn't make everyone happy, right? So... Uh, there are a lot of diverse preferences, and so it's shepherding that and doing it well that's important. Uh, singing a song that is not in a style that you prefer is an opportunity to hold the door and receive a blessing. Let's look at Philippians 2, verse 3. I'm going to start from verse 1. So if there is any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation in the Spirit, any affection and sympathy, complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. There are times where I will pick a song literally based on one person that I know is going to be there. One person. When we have, what, like 500, 600 in the room? But I know that he's not going to be the only person that's blessed by that song. There will be others. But uh, I know that, like, man, that, that saint has deferred and deferred and deferred and deferred and hasn't complained once and it's time we get some of their preferences up in here and just let them sing their heart songs and sing it fully and joyfully. And when we around him or her can hold the door and join them in that, even if it's not our favorite thing, that is God honoring. That's glorifying to God. Um, it's something that we can rejoice in. Uh, we talk about how worship stirs up emotions, right? And some of the things that shape our preferences are nostalgia, um, our backgrounds. So we don't want to only stir up emotions. We don't want to live in nostalgia. But if we can, with all other things, all other boxes being checked, of doctrinal integrity, congregational singability, all those other things, if all those things can be checked and we can, with that, sweep across the room and someone can sing a song that they remember from their childhood that means the world to them, that their grandmother sang on their deathbed, whatever it may be, and we can hit all of those things at the same time. That's a sweet, sweet thing, and we try to do that. And it's, when that comes, it, it may not be hitting you in that way, but we hold the door and let it bless someone else, and that's the glory of deference. Um, also in our instrumentation... Uh, the instruments we play and the ways that we play them will grow in diversity as our church grows in diversity. Uh, we had um, some new folks that joined on, and our uh, John Saylor is playing violin with us. 
pretty regularly. He works at crossings, so he's like busy on a lot of Sundays. But um, you know, not everyone gets a flute on Sunday mornings, but we do because we have a talented flautist that's here and willing to serve in that way. Um, so our our instrumentation grows as the diversity of our body grows. A range of musical backgrounds are represented on the stage each week. If you don't believe me, just listen to the band at rehearsal when I talk about doing something and trying to make it sound more like Coldplay, and the whole band groans because I'm the only person on the stage that likes Coldplay. <laughs> I, I, that's what I'm saying. I don't know how that's possible. But... And it's not just like age divided, like Belle's the youngest one up there, and she's like, oh, he goes talking about Coldplay again. <laughs> right, yeah. So I think Micah's got me a little bit there. But, uh, but all of our musical backgrounds are different. The songs that we jump into and play between songs are different, and that's great. That's awesome that God brings those together and helps us to lead in unity to worship others in unity. Uh, last few points will be done. So shepherding, uh, preference and deference do not open the door for a free-for-all. This is just like the quality thing. Like, uh, this doesn't mean that anything goes, right? It comes back to the responsibility is on your shepherds in, in guarding this and doing it well. That's why pray for your pastors, guys. This is, these are hard decisions that are being made every week. Um, when uh, someone comes to me who I know has just been deferring and deferring and deferring, and hasn't complained, and then says, like, will you please sing this song? And in my heart, I just know, oh, brother, no, we're never going to sing that song. <laughs> and that's so hard for me, because I want to, but it doesn't check those other boxes that are more important, right? So it's hard. Your pastors are called and equipped to shepherd us through a carefully curated worship ministry that reflects, but is not directed by, the preferences of the body. All right, let's stop there. Any final questions? So far, hey, you know, if you can do it to the glory of the Lord, I don't think we'll see it at Buck Run. Um, I have been in a service where it has been used and did not see it coming, and it scared me to death. I thought, I thought this is it. We're going home. <laughs> the trumpet has been sounded. Yes. Yeah, and there's a whole, we could talk for hours about the science behind mantra and why those words are repeated over and over again and what they achieve and, Yeah. So there's reasons we avoid that. So I'm glad you noticed that. Right, right. Again, everything has balance. Uh, one quick little anecdote. I told some of the band this last week about, um, since we were talking about worship wars, I forgot to bring this up. Uh, Dr. Moeller told this really funny story one time that I think it was in the late 80s, early 90s. Um, someone called together, like the Avengers assembled, right? Like all the big theological minds got together Moeller was there, Adrian Rogers, uh, John Piper, Mark Dever, like a ton of, like if you can think of prominent people from that time period, they were there. And the idea was, what are we going to do about the worship wars? And there was people on different sides of the argument represented there. You know, Adrian Rogers is like, we're, we're going hymns and we're going organ and we're going to bring in an orchestra. And, you know, other guys are like, I don't know, I think I think there's something to this, like contemporary music. And, and it got heated and there was a lot of bickering and it was all about like is the content rich enough what are these words teaching blah 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 and john piper who is like in person the most humble quietest man who hadn't said anything just stood up and the room got quiet and he said gentlemen we all come from churches that grew up singing do lord oh do lord oh do remember me <laughs> And here we are having theological debates. So the church will go on. We will survive. <laughs> we will be okay. And it was just a great call back to earth of like, all of this is important. None of this is the gospel, right? Like none of this is what's going to make or break the kingdom of God, keep it from coming. So we study it. We learn about it. Uh, we want to do our best. And now that we have the knowledge, you're all accountable for it, right? You shouldn't have come because now you know. Um, but we strive and we do our best for the glory of the Lord. All right. Thank you, guys. We'll see you in worship.